On November 13, 1974, Karen Silkwood was still reeling from the news of her plutonium contamination. She went to a union meeting at a coffee shop in Crescent, Oklahoma, where she confided in a co-worker. Karen did tell me that she hadn't was exposed enough that, you know, she would die, you know, from radiation, cancer, or, you know, any way it could affect you many, many ways. But she told me that she would not live. Karen also revealed her plans for that night. She was going to blow the whistle on her employer, Kerr McGee. Karen had all this stuff that she was going to take to Oklahoma City to the Holiday Inn. She had all of it, and she kept flipping through the papers, you know. And she had a big manila folder. I'd say a good, it was bigger than an 10 And it was just about that thick. At about 7 p.m., Karen left Crescent to make the 30-mile drive to meet a reporter from the New York Times. About a half an hour later, her Honda was discovered less than 10 miles from Crescent, crumpled into the concrete wall of an underground ditch. The first officer at the scene found her purse, in it two marijuana cigarettes and a quaalude. Papers with a Kerr McGee letterhead were scattered on the ground. He picked them up and put them in the car. Karen's boyfriend, the Times reporter, and her union contact were waiting for her in Oklahoma City. They got a phone call at about 10 p.m. I was the one, I was sitting there with Drew Stevens, her, her boyfriend, and I had to turn around and I had to tell Drew that his girlfriend has been killed. The men drove to the scene of the accident. My memory is Drew had cried, and it was very eerie. And it was a cold night, and the wind was blowing, but we actually found a paperback novel she had been reading. And I remember we got in the car, and we had the, you know, the dome light, the car light on, and it was splattered with her blood. And that was pretty sobering. That night, back in Texas, police informed the Silkwood family that Karen had been killed in a car accident. I was laying in my bed, and I heard the conversation, but I kept thinking, this is just all a dream. I'm just going to lay here long enough and wake up, and it's just not going to be real. After midnight, officials from the Atomic Energy Commission and Karen's employer, Kerr McGee, searched the car at a local garage. The next morning, her boyfriend, the reporter, and the union official had their chance. Papers regarding the issues that we were interested in uh, weren't in there. And she had told us that she had them. And she had told us that she was ready and she was going to be bringing them with her uh, to this meeting. That day, Karen's children were told that their mother had died. Dad had taken us all, put us in the car, and told us we were going to go get some ice cream. And when he said it, it almost seemed like, you know, it was just said in passing. It wasn't like anything to focus on. Of course, you know, five years old. But uh, it was kind of like hearing that an aunt or somebody had passed away. It was the day after my birthday. I remember him saying, your mom was killed last night. And, of course, Mike and Dawn had no concept of what had happened. And I just remember going, she's never coming back to get me. She's gone forever. She's really gone now. Karen's family had to bury her in a new dress because all of her clothes had been destroyed by a Kerr McGee decontamination unit. Authorities ruled Silkwood's death an accident, concluding that she was under the influence of drugs. I would either put her probably either totally asleep or in some t state of stupor from uh, induced by the uh, medication she was taking. It appeared at the scene and from the physical evidence at the scene that she ran off the road of, by herself. But the union suspected foul play and hired an accident reconstruction expert. Her family also hired an investigator. They disputed the official findings the medical examiner's report found high levels of quaaludes in Silkwood's bloodstream, 
However, their research indicated that she was conscious just moments before impact. I noticed that the extent of physical damage that she had uh, was inconsistent with someone who was, uh, had fallen asleep at the wheel and or uh, someone who was intoxicated. That she, in fact, it showed me that she was stiff and braced. They also found fresh dents in the car's rear bumper. In my opinion, and the people that I've had working with me, there's no circumstantial evidence there to indicate that somebody may, hit, another vehicle may have hit the car in the rear. The nagging question was Karen Silkwood murdered? I think Karma Gee paid somebody to run her off the road. After Karen died, Dad didn't work a whole lot anymore. He devoted his life to trying to find out exactly what was going on and what happened to Karen and who killed her. Now, you know, Oklahoma's pretty flat, and there are not all that many culverts. And for someone to have planned this, as a way of murdering is just impossible. It could not have been a planned murder. I think it's possible that someone set out to scare her. In the months after her death, government reports verified many of Silkwood's accusations against Kerr McGee, including the falsification of quality control records. The Atomic Energy Commission also concluded that Silkwood could not have contaminated herself because the plutonium she ingested had come from a restricted area at the plant. That mystery remains. In 1976, two years after her death, Karen Silkwood's family filed a civil suit charging Kerr McGee with willful negligence in allowing Karen to be contaminated with plutonium. Three years later, a jury awarded the Silkwood estate $10.5 million. I feel like it, uh, Karen has been vindicated, and what she was saying was true, and I think the American public believes her now. It sends a message to uh, the government and uh, to the nuclear industry that they have to tell the truth, and that if they don't tell the truth, they have to be prepared to pay the fiddler. Karen Silkwood has been hailed as a whistleblower who paid the ultimate price for her convictions. Because she died and because the women's movement and the anti-nuke movement and others uh, latched onto her body and, you know, exploited it and sometimes shamelessly, it became a very big and powerful force for those who opposed nuclear energy. And I think that that is part of the reason the Silkwood story was such a big deal. When I talk to my children about Karen, I tell them how proud I am of her and that she chose. She, it, it was a hard road to go for her to take a stand like she did in her job and trying to help the people of Kermagee. She could have easily walked away, came home, and left it. But that wasn't her. For Silkwood's children, her legacy is more complex and painful. For a long time, I just absolutely, for a lack of better way to describe it, I hated her. As I've gotten older and as I've had children, I have done a lot of forgiving to Karen. I sometimes think that maybe because of whatever the circumstances were, that she couldn't be there for her children, that she made up to society, and she was there for mankind. I'd just like to find out a little bit about her, find out what her feelings for her family were, maybe find out if she could do it all over again, would she, if she had done it and known what the outcome was going to be, would she still be as willing to give up everything for what she believed in?